Hey everyone, welcome to the E2 Effective Elders podcast. Visit us at e2elders.org and please share this good word with others. Hey everybody, welcome back to the E2 podcast and how grateful we are to CDF Capital for making it possible. Uh, longtime partners in ministry with E2. And we welcome back again, Dr. Billy. And Dr. Billy is uh, with uh, Moberly Central Christian College of the Bible in Moberly, Missouri, leading and teaching in their graduate school. And we've got Jeff Fall. Jeff is uh, probably going on his 50th year now at uh, Mount Gilead uh, in Morrisville. Uh, Jeff and Billy, welcome to the podcast. We're grateful. Thank you. And one footnote, Gary, Jeff and mm -hmm. I were freshmen together. Cincinnati Christian <laughs> University. Yeah, just a couple of years memories. ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jeff, what is it now? Uh, your year going on thirty-five. Yep, yeah, that's 35. what I thought. Going on thirty-five. That's incredible. What a great run you've had yeah. uh, at MG Church. And um, uh, for those who are listening and are watching, Jeff also is a part of E two. He's on our board of directors. He's on the bench, just like Doctor Billy. Uh, our coaching bench, and we're grateful for the years of ministry and their education that they bring uh, to uh, this conversation today. What we're going to do, we're going to explore here now in our March podcast, this question, who can be elders? Mm -hmm. Who can be elders? We've looked at in January, the five responsibilities of elders, and we kept that conversation going on elder recruitment and whatnot. Uh, now we're going to talk about who can be elders. So, uh, gentlemen, why don't we just uh, toss that out? Uh, you know, typically today, there's a less than effective manner in which people are onboarded as elders. We look at it. It comes from history, from our world of uh, democratic politics. People are nominated. Their names go on to a ballot. Uh, votes are cast at an annual meeting, and we end up having elders, and they serve for a stated period of time. And uh, any any insights from the two of you as to uh, uh, that method of onboarding elders? Jeff? Well, it, just take, it takes me back to uh, um, you know one of my earliest ministries, uh, when I went to the church, they had maybe about 100 people, and mm -hmm. they had um, 10 elders and 16 deacons. Mm -hmm. And they would put a slate of nominations up every year. And the mm -hmm. way it actually worked is if you were a pretty nice guy and you'd been at the church for a while, you would end up on that board. And the deacons mm -hmm. could outvote the elders, and you, uh, a preacher didn't even have a vote. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, you had to take everything to a monthly meeting to mm -hmm. get permission for anything. And they were some wonderful people, well-intentioned. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. but it stifled the future of the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my, my first church was very similar to that. It had more deacons on the board than we had. We only had three elders and had about mm -hmm. eight deacons, but then we also had four um, trustees, mm -hmm. which could outvote the deacons and elders combined because mm -hmm. they controlled the property. So it was, mm -hmm. it was uh, put to me that it is the, we're trying to do checks and balances here mm -hmm. that you got the preacher, he's the executive branch, and then you got board. Uh, they're the, the legislative branch, and then you got the trustees, they're the judicial mm -hmm. branch. And the one thing we want to make sure is nobody gets anything done. And, yeah, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, whenever there's a vote, somebody wins and somebody, <laughs> somebody loses. loses. Yeah. 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 And so we, We've just made every effort to maintain disunity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Yeah. Um, and in that church, mm -hmm. the nominations for elder or deacon or trustee consisted of writing the nomination in anonymously on a slip of paper yeah. and turning it in two weeks before election. Mm -hmm. No one was excluded. And um, there were times that people were nominated who hadn't been in church in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I might all just also just throw in there, um, Gary, that some of these people were some of the finest people and mm -hmm. they loved the Lord and they uh, they loved the church. They just couldn't see beyond 
the tradition of how they did things and they paid a yeah. very dear price for it. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a powerful mm -hmm. statement. Uh, they couldn't see beyond tradition. And you know, uh, back in the day, uh, our churches, as they're forming, organizing and whatnot, they look to this incredible form of government, uh, the United States of America. There's not a country like it on the face of God's green earth. And this uh, democratic model, if it works for the government, it should work for the church. Similarly, when corporations were invented and onboarded at uh, the end of the 1800s uh, and uh, boards of directors were then uh, created with a chairman mm -hmm. of the board. And we even had an article in the Christian Standard in the early 1900s advocating, urging churches to create a board of directors. So we have a corporate board model married to a democratic model, and neither of those work well uh, in the church because they're not found anywhere uh, in the scriptures. So, and they even went into Sunday school classes. Uh, remember, yeah. Sunday school classes having class presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a veteran. Nobody loves mm -hmm. America more than me. Uh -huh. But last time I checked, I think the church is a theocracy not a democracy, democracy and yeah. jesus is in charge of it yeah absolutely there's one head of the church and it would be him uh so we have this imperfect uh model or template and if we want to swing the pendulum to that which is far more perfect we find that in the word of god uh hence who can be an elder how do we onboard these elders uh where where would you guys go in uh, that blueprint of scripture. Well, you know, a phrase comes to my mind um, from scripture uh, in Acts chapter 20. It says, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Mm -hmm. And I think some people like to just throw that language around. Well, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. makes leaders. And certainly mm -hmm. that's true. But the question is, how does the Holy Spirit make leaders. And mm -hmm. we might think back in Bible history to uh, burning bushes or uh, lots mm -hmm. being cast or setting out a fleece or uh, being blinded mm -hmm. on the road to Damascus. Um, but how does the Holy Spirit make leaders in regard to the eldership of the church? Mm -hmm. And it might be in less dramatic fashion, but the Holy Spirit inspiring scripture gave us a blueprint mm -hmm. for uh the Holy Spirit to choose leaders within the church today mm -hmm. when we follow the instruction he's given us mm -hmm. in that regard. And so I think yeah. that's where it starts is going back to the New Testament mm -hmm. to see how the Holy Spirit made leaders in regard to the elders mm -hmm. in the early church. Yeah, I know that uh, over there at Mount Gilead, uh, your elder team, uh, you use a, uh, a sieve, so to speak, how, how the Holy Spirit does indeed stir and raise up uh, the next generation of elders, but you've got, uh, isn't it four um, elements to that? Yeah, if we look at it kind of like a filter, and I'm not putting these in any particular um, order, uh, mm -hmm. but for one thing, he would have to aspire mm -hmm. to serve as an elder. If you drag somebody kicking and screaming, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. don't desire the um, position of an elder, um, mm -hmm. really it's it's not going to work out well so mm -hmm. one one part of that uh, filter would be for them to aspire the office and, uh, mm -hmm. another would be obviously the approval of God mm -hmm. uh, Billy and I had a a teacher um, a lot of people know him Bob Stacy and he always said oh, the yeah. most oh, yeah. important degree for anybody to get mm -hmm. is their AUG degree approved unto God and mm -hmm. we have some templates in the New Testament that tell us what the character and the life of an elder ought to look like mm -hmm. and God's approval as an elder has to pass uh, that picture that profile mm -hmm those qualifications, we sometimes call them as an elder. So we've got the aspiration of the person who is a candidate to be the elder, mm -hmm. but we also have um, the approval of God. Mm -hmm. And then I think in some form or another, the third uh, aspect of that would be the appraisal of people. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of the Acts 6 um, model, not that we mm -hmm. have a nomination with uh, a slate and make it like a, a vote where somebody wins and somebody loses, mm -hmm. But at least people are being led by somebody that they're willing to follow. And so there is an appraisal uh, by the people. And then um, finally, there would be the appointing of the elder. And I think as long as it's a healthy team that already exists, that the current leaders, including mm -hmm. the preacher, 
are part of appointing that person. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you look at what's laid out in scripture, um, those three C's we often talk about when we hire mm -hmm. somebody, uh, chemistry mm -hmm. and competence mm -hmm. and character, those are seen in the, in the profile mm -hmm. qualifications of an elder. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so at a very basic level, in order for the Holy Spirit to choose a leader, it kind of has to go through that four levels mm -hmm. um, sieve, at least in an yeah. you know, And you're those, talking about yeah. Titus mm -hmm. 1, uh, mm -hmm. the list there, and, and, and 1 Timothy 3. Mm -hmm. Correct. That are the attributes of the person. So it's just mm -hmm. not, have you been here long enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Holy Spirit's who, who shapes somebody as a leader. And, mm -hmm. and so that's just, a, in there's a general outline of who, right. the kind of person not the specific person and nowhere, unfortunately, nowhere in the new Testament, do we get instructions on exactly how to do this? Do you do it by congregational vote? Uh, are the elders, the selection team and the filter? So maybe you, you two could talk about that as a process. What ought to be mm -hmm. normative? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what you are describing, Jeff, those four letter, uh, th those four words with the letter a. So, the the first one aspire i went immediately in my brain while you were just des describing that to first peter chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 yeah we have to desire this um and, and it's not a guilt trip that we're saying oh yeah uh, nobody else will do it so i'll do it when you talked about uh approved unto god i went what what you just said billy titus chapter 1 and first timothy chapter 3 you know here mm -hmm. are these traits of god am i uh, above reproach, if you will. Um, so approved by God. When you mentioned uh, about the affirmed by the people, it wasn't affirmed. What was the, that word? Affirmed by the appraised. people? Appraised. Appraised. Uh -huh. Appraised, affirmed by the people. And uh, you did mention Acts chapter 6, when the apostles said to the men bringing the complaint that the Greek-speaking widows were starving to death, being overlooked in the daily distribution of food day after day after day, uh, go and uh, select from among you seven men known to be full of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit and wisdom, mm -hmm. known to be full, choose, and that word choose, meaning to vet, carefully select, examine, uh, and then that appointment, again, uh, where even Paul says to Titus, go and uh, appoint elders in these cities there on Crete. Mm -hmm. uh, you you took us right back into the, the word of God, not into a political, historical, corporate template, but to the word of God template. You know, Billy, um, uh, you, you are our New Testament scholar. Oh. If we dig down into the um, 1 Timothy 3, listing. Yes. Just talk about that. You know, uh, I, I've literally seen, I've been uh, around the block a few times working with uh, E2, and uh, I can remember being in a church where it was a nominating season, and they had the insert in the bulletin with uh, those phrases and words out of 1 Timothy and Titus um, and not given to much wine. And then there was a column, yes or no, where you were to put your check mark. Uh, not uh, anger, given to anger, uh, house, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his, his children under his command, etc. cetera. Uh, husband of one wife. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why don't you talk about uh, that checklist, so to speak? Well, first, a church has to say, you know, are these guidelines normative guidelines for <clears throat> a potentially healthy leader mm -hmm. and also are the normative guidelines for someone to continue to be a leader and mm -hmm. and i think that's the purpose of them uh it is to tell us what's normative uh, what to look for what to initiate but also mm -hmm. how to be and and what to aspire to and there are just different uh, words in there you can turn it into a simple checklist, or you can say, "No, it's a more holistic thing." We're looking holistic. for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're looking for a mature person uh, mm -hmm. that would lead uh, under the auspices of following Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest stumbling block in that list in our culture is the one that's uh, three Greek words. It's they appear in Titus one and in First Timothy three in the list is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
uh, a one woman man, one woman man. The churches I'm asked all the time, well, if a person is divorced, is that automatically exclusionary to them uh, becoming an elder? Is that a limiting factor that ex that's, uh, um, disqualifies one for the remainder of their life? And we're going to hear that mm -hmm. phrase, one woman man, correctly. We're going to have to hear it in the context of the first century Roman mm -hmm. lifestyle. And part of that first century Roman lifestyle, it was required by law to be monogamous, mm -hmm. but you, but it was not required or expected uh, for a man to be sexually faithful. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. the greater your status, uh, the more mistresses and sexual mm -hmm. conquests you were expected to have. So what Paul is calling for here is not... A person can't ever be divorced and recover from that tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's calling for a faithfulness to mm -hmm. one's spouse if they're married, which is a radical countercultural statement if you want to get ahead in Roman society. Mm -hmm. So then uh, would, would you say that uh, the opening line of chapter 3, 1 Timothy an elder must be above reproach. Is that kind of like a canopy? And this is then what it looks like to be above reproach. Then we read of these different character traits. Absolutely. Uh, they didn't have, in the ancient Greek text, they didn't have bullets, you know, mm -hmm. the little dots. Yeah. Uh, but above reproach then is being defined by those different characteristics. All of them together What's it look like to be above reproach? Mm -hmm. And so as Jeff points out, you have to be aspire to be an elder. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be apt to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then above reproach. And then it comes to bullet listed. Here's what an above reproach life mm -hmm. looks like. Mm -hmm. Got it. You know, one other, you know, and I like to use the word profile because of that holistic goal that we're shooting toward. But mm -hmm. one other thing that I think snags a lot of people is managing your household well and children not accused of riotous mm -hmm. living. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen grief compounded for an elder because he has a wayward child or the child has some momentary wayward mm -hmm. activity. And suddenly, if this is legalistically applied, then this person is no longer capable of serving mm -hmm. as an elder. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I think of a God himself is a perfect father, mm -hmm. but he has children that make bad decisions. And I know because I'm one of them. So and true. so I think sometimes if you approach that particular section legalistically, you can rule out some, some really mm -hmm. good leaders. And yes. um, I, I come across churches all the time that say they don't have any elders and when you ask them why not, they say no one's qualified. Mm -hmm. And when you yeah. dig down a little bit deeper, it's mm -hmm. because there is not a person who could meet the kind oh, of yeah. stringent mm -hmm. legalistic application mm -hmm. that they're making of this list mm -hmm. of qualifications. On the yeah. other hand, each one of those statements means something, and they're mm -hmm. not to be discarded or dismissed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and they're, they're, they're not to be a litmus test mm -hmm. of exclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, they're just a, a, a profile of mm -hmm. what a person's supposed to look like. And the other thing is, what if someone in their past, mm -hmm. something on that list, they've breached something on that list mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Are any of those things now exclusionary or are we supposed to look at how are they living their life today mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ? I mean, we... We either, live, we either believe in radical forgiveness mm -hmm. <laughs> or we don't believe in radical yeah. forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember years ago, my dad giving the example of, imagine you have two brothers. They're not believers. One of them has a high school sweetheart and um, they get married young, 17, mm -hmm. 18 years of age. The other uh, gentleman, twin brother, has multiple partners and mm -hmm. is lives a very promiscuous lifestyle. Later in life, they come to Christ. They both grow in Christ. Mm -hmm. And it comes time that people suggest that these two brothers can be elders. And some well-meaning person says, 
well, Joe can't be an elder because he's been divorced. The only woman he's ever known is mm -hmm. that high school sweetheart that he married when he was 17 and the marriage didn't last. But his brother is capable of being an elder, even though he's had multiple partners mm -hmm. and both of them, it happened before they were believers. Uh, a misunderstanding of that part of the eldership list mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. can cause great pain and difficulty and cause us to yeah. miss tremendous potential uh, leaders. Yeah, that's a great point that you bring up, Jeff. And then what, what about this one, too? Um, when it mentions here in the text, uh, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. What mm -hmm. happens when we have an elder candidate without children? I think that the, the whole list is about who are you today? based on your experiences mm -hmm. nowhere to say that you have to have children mm -hmm. it's it's in the context of if you have children mm -hmm. and then i've i've had the i've had occasions where i had an elder that wanted to leave the the eldership he's a great elder because his 42 year old son uh, got caught in a crime of of mm -hmm. uh, being arrested for possession of marijuana, mm -hmm. and so he in, he was interpreting that text as, "Well, I'm not in, I'm not in control of my own family." And I'm going, "Now mm -hmm. wait a minute, you've got mm -hmm. Ezekiel 18, mm -hmm. which talks about you know people come of age and and children will grow up mm -hmm. and do wrong things. And that's on them, and that's their choice. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's not a requirement. You must have children." Mm -hmm. And no matter what their age are, they must be mm -hmm. under yeah. your supervision. Uh, I'm I'm glad that we're clarifying that statement. Uh, his children must obey him because even here at the creek, we had for years a gentleman serving as an incredible, humble uh, man of God, shepherd of the flock, and uh, Norm never had children. Uh, he, he brought into his home a niece who. Uh, whose father had died, and um, she was left uh, without a dad at a very young age. Um, but yet Norm was a father figure to her, yet he did not feel as if he could be an elder because of that statement in First Timothy chapter 3. And wow. I know there are many uh, people uh, of that same frame of mind. I, I don't have any kids, ergo I do not meet the qualifications of being an elder. I, I, it has everything to do with how we view those lists. Are they yes. uh, in concrete, non-negotiable, or do we see them as a guideline? This is what a, a, a person above reproach would resemble. Mm -hmm. So hey, let's talk a little bit before we uh, get too far uh, close to our end time. Um, uh, what about when it comes to who can be an elder, uh, we still have uh, issues with the preacher being an elder. Uh, thoughts on can a preacher be an elder? Uh, I, I, yeah, Jeff. Ahead. No, you go, back. I didn't realize till Gary and I were talking last week. Um, in, my, in my own case, in some churches as preacher, I've been not been an elder. Some churches in preacher, as preacher, I have been an elder. And I can tell you which one I like better. But I didn't know until last week that you had elected not to be an elder in your church. I'm, I'm anxious to hear about this. Yeah. Well, it's not because I think it would be wrong for me to do so. Mm -hmm. um, it's because I think it would be wrong for me to do so. Uh, yeah. It's not something I desire to do. And I think the pattern of the preacher being an elder is a completely acceptable scriptural pattern. Um, you know, the elder who rules well and gives his attention to preaching and teaching and is worthy of double mm -hmm. honor certainly seems mm -hmm. to describe a leader among peers. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you have a preacher who is also an elder. But in the more traditional understanding of the restoration movement, you had elders and deacons and you also had what's referred to in scripture as the evangelist or the minister. And I've kind of avoided the term evangelist simply because of the baggage that goes with it. You know, mm -hmm. people hear the word evangelist and they think three sermons in a fast car. Yeah. Um, 
but you see, <laughs> you, you see, I'll, I'll take the fast car part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You see Paul telling Timothy mm -hmm. that part of his task is to ordain elders in every church mm -hmm. to see to it that the elders who rule well are worthy of double honor to rebuke elders who sin so that others will be fearful mm -hmm. of sinning mm -hmm. and it seems to me that there is a mutual accountability between the person who serves as the preacher and those yeah. who serve as mm -hmm. the elders and i think in the restoration movement because of our rightful fear of clergy laity distinction, even Alexander Campbell and some of our forebears um, ran away from any authority in the hands of the preacher. Mm -hmm. And consequently, uh, the preacher became a hireling. Hey, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we hired you, we can fire you. You come mm -hmm. to the meeting and you ask permission. We're the overseers and the leaders uh, what we say goes mm -hmm, when goes. actually the new testament presented much more of a mutual accountability there yeah and so mm -hmm. i think either approach is scriptural depending on the context of that local congregation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the age and capability uh -huh. of the preacher mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I graduated from Cincinnati Christian University and I was 22 years old I had no business Mm -hmm. serving as an elder, but I could serve as a preacher who worked mm -hmm. mutually with accountability, responsibility, and authority with mm -hmm. those people. And so I got into that kind of a model early and just stayed there. But I think either way, depending on the congregation and the context, either way is acceptable and it functions mm -hmm. the same way. Right. Uh, regardless of which model that you take, as long as everybody understands New Testament mm -hmm. polity. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. That makes sense? Good yeah, good right. Good insight. I do mm -hmm. want to let you know, my friend, though, I am not an ordained minister. I'm an ordained evangelist. Good for you. That's wow. what it says. Is that what yeah. it says on your ordination certificate? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And, huh. and uh, uh, But nobody calls you that anymore. So, mm -hmm. but, yeah. But, I, yeah. Well, Billy, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think it's, I think normative, the preacher is an elder, but it's also mm -hmm. situational in its context, mm -hmm. just like Jeff is, is pointing out. We don't need anything of official mm -hmm. if it's functioning in a healthy way. And I know that mm -hmm. Jeff and his elders function in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So why go dot? Uh, I's and cross T's or, mm -hmm. or, and may turn into some legalities. Uh, mm -hmm. But in, in the end, it's got to work also for the preacher. Mm -hmm. The preacher has to aspire to it. And Jeff in his mm -hmm. good conscience and good theology says, not me, not now. And, mm -hmm. and that has mm -hmm. to be honored. But as you pointed out, every, everyone, you, Jeff, you and your elders are functioning like you're an elder, correct? If I went to them tomorrow and told them that I would like to become an elder, um, they would be fine with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I like it that yeah. they're honoring your conscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the uh, question, can a preacher be an elder, um, is uh, clearly um, permissible in Scripture. Uh, and I, I would concur with you. Your opening statement, Jeff, was... Uh, inclusive of the word desire. So here at the creek, where I was a preacher for 30 years, I was uh, also an elder, not in word only or name only, but going through the process where I had to feel led of the Holy Spirit, prompted of the Holy Spirit, desiring to serve in that capacity. And I had to go through a vetting process, just like anybody else would have to go through a vetting process. And um, then the uh, uh, affirmed by, uh, appraised by people. Um, and so, uh, but that was a, a desire of, of my interior world. I wanted to do that. So uh, where I think, just as Billy made mention of the word health, where there is a lack of health, uh, when, for example, a preacher is not permitted 
to be an elder, let's say it's in the, the governing documents of the church mm-hmm. and the bylaws, anybody can be an elder uh, except the preacher. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, we've, and oftentimes it's because of what people call like conflict of interest. Well, where does that come from? Uh, our political democratic template. There is no such thing as a conflict of interest. If if we have a strong man of God as the preacher, he loves the Lord and and his bride, uh, the church. Um, there, there's not going to be a conflict of interest. So, well, you know, um, here's a uh, an obvious question that we need to uh, pose because of the again where we are as a culture. Can women be an elder? You know, who can be an elder? We just talked about the preacher. Well, what about the ladies who are in the okay. church? Okay, I've got to go now. Goodbye. <laughs> see you. You guys finish this discussion. Please see well, the links in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well the one thing that we, we do want to say is that, obviously, at E2, uh, we have... Um, and when we look at the Word of God, we have taken the New Testament and we've reached a conclusion based on our exegesis of the text. And we're not going to impose that on any congregation. We are all autonomous uh, as congregations. Each congregation must reach their mm-hmm. own conclusion. But we do want people to know at E2, we have studied the scriptures and we have reached what we believe to be a theological position. And that's complementarianism and um so you guys want to talk a little bit unpacking this uh last part of our conversation today yeah the, the complementarian and e- versus egalitarian views um the complementarian view is that god made men and women uh differently but he made them uh, with full value of personhood but mm-hmm. he gave them different roles um And then the egalitarian says, well, not only are they of equal value, there's no role restrictions based on gender. Mm -hmm. And so we at E2, we subscribe to the complementarian view that that, uh, all all persons are of equal value in the eyes of the Lord, but that the Lord has called, based on gender, uh, some to some ministry and Mm -hmm. others to uh, not some ministry. And particularly, we're, we're down to where elder is concerned. It's it's just impossible to get around the grammar of mm-hmm. Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3, w- mm-hmm. when he says, a one woman man. There's mm-hmm. just no way around the, the grammar of that. Mm-hmm. So um, our view is that the role of elder ought be restricted mm-hmm. to uh, um, men, qualified men. Mm-hmm. But then again, we're not a denominational headquarters. We don't have control mm-hmm. over any church or, or what they do. Mm-hmm. So I'll let you guys kind of pick up the ball from there. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think that's well said, um, Dr. Billy. Um, and certainly we have a complementarian position. And so mm-hmm. uh, that's automatically going mm-hmm. to answer this question for us. Um, mm-hmm. But I think also the qualifications, as you've already mentioned, the husband of one wife, but there's, mm-hmm. there's one other thing that comes to my mind. You know, historically in, in our movement, um, as we've emphasized the importance of baptism, um, we haven't just looked at the statements in the epistles and the, mm-hmm. the doctrinal statements about baptism. We've looked at the patterns in the mm-hmm. book of Acts. In other words, we've said, how did the New Testament church actually um, work this out mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the daily life of the church? And I think sometimes that kind of approach can also be helpful uh, for other subjects, in, mm-hmm. including this one. Mm-hmm. And we don't have an example of any female elders or any indication mm-hmm. that there were female elders. And so even as we go through the book of Acts and, and as that shapes our theology and how we apply what we've arrived at here, um, we, we don't see any example or indication of that. Mm-hmm. And so that that leads me to affirm the traditional position that elders are men. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you gentlemen see the chat box on your screen by any chance? Yes. 
Okay, yes. I just wanted to make sure that it, uh, when I opened it, it was visible. So here are a couple of resources that people might want to uh, explore. In Christianity Today, there was uh, an exceptional article. Dr. Billy makes this recommendation. It It is this presentation of both complementarian and egalitarian views. Similarly, on the E2 website, e2elders.org, if you click on resources, uh, there's a tab that says free stuff. And uh, there is an article there uh, by Dr. Bobby Harrington, uh, who leads the renew.org ministry. And Bobby wrote that article. And again, it's an exceptionally well-written article. Yep. And, and as both of you have affirmed, um, Gary, our churches are autonomous. Mm -hmm. We can't make this decision for anybody, and mm -hmm. we respect Correct. the autonomy mm -hmm. of each local church and the mm -hmm. responsibility of each group of elders to study and come to their conclusions in mm -hmm. regard to this. Mm -hmm. yeah, and there are, there are people of good conscience on both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing we don't need to do whatever view we hold is crucify those mm -hmm. who hold a different view. Mm -hmm. you know, we just live within the context of our work out our own salvation mm -hmm. with fear mm -hmm. and trembling. Paul mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we are uh, right at the uh, stop time of our podcast. Uh, brothers, that was a great conversation on who can be an elder uh, let's make sure that we, as a leadership team, we're moving further and further away from what historically uh, has been done in far too many churches, the nominating, the electing uh, democratically uh, of people into this role, and let's move uh, definitively, increasingly into scriptural models and scriptural mandates, mm -hmm. and uh, let's follow, thus saith the Lord. Um, in, in his word for a blueprint. And what will happen is we're going to find churches getting healthy. And then when churches get healthy, churches uh, begin growing again. So, That's it. all right. Thank you, brothers. And Thank uh, you. We so appreciate uh, all that you bring to the bride of Christ, uh, the church. Thank you for your ministries. Uh, and especially thank you for saving a little bit of your time for this thing called E2. We're grateful for the way that you invest uh, in elders across the country and around the world. Thanks, brothers. God bless you. See you, bros.